how do we look at the periodic table of elements? Now, as I said right at the start, that in the medical lectures and medical literature in general, it's about 15 elements is all that the anthroposophical literature discusses and talks about and gives indications about their energetic activity. But as we know with the periodic table, that there's um, a whole lot more than that. And so um, the question is, how do we uh, cope with this? We've got 120 odd elements, not 15. So how can we approach that to, first of all, find out what is the energetic activity of all of these elements so that we can use them within our biodynamic context? And um, so, so that became the first question. Now, I, I should say this, for me, this question arose in 1996. And so now I look back, it's now 18 years that this work has developed and I was thinking about it this morning and I thought well it doesn't seem that long because it's been one day at a time you know every day is and all of a sudden it's 18 years so I'm sort of amazed at that but that's the, the question and and so we have one hour to sort of overview this so I'm going to have to make some sort of fairly big jumps but I can assure you it has been a logical step-by-step -step process and if we had the time I could, I'd love to run you through it. So the first question that arises for me with regards to the periodic table is that we've got a rectangular diagram in front of us. But when I ask you what's the molecular or the atomic structure of an atom of calcium, what are you going to describe to me? And what you're going to describe is a nucleus with rings of electrons or clouds of electrons or however you want to do it, but it's going to be a three-dimensional structure is what you're going to tell me. And so one of the first problems with chemistry that I had, and I know other people have, is that I've got to keep making that jump from a rectangle to a three-dimensional sphere all the time. And that that's quite a challenge. And so the first question, well the first answer was, well why don't we make it a circle? Just at least start with a circle and see if we can see what happens with it because it's already a sphere. So, And so that became the first question. And we can see here that within the structure of the periodic table we have these major elements, what's so called the major elements, and there's eight of those. And then we come into this group in the middle here, which is called the transition elements or the trace elements, and there's 10 groups of those. And then we have down here the lathanoids and aconoids, that is 14 of those. So it's actually three groups of elements. And uh, so let's <coughs> just start, you know, with the major elements. Um, this is all looking at Hauschka. We had time we could look at Hauschka and what he said and how it all worked and the problems of Hauschka. And um, so this is this is what we're being asked to imagine. This is essentially an image, it's actually an image of the solar system, but again that's this basic image of electrons. And there's seven rings of electrons that we have. Now um, Ultimately, we come to this picture here. And if you just remember what I said, we have eight arms, eight groups of major elements. And it just so happens when we look at this picture here, we have eight arms on this picture as well. Okay, so hmm, maybe they might have a relationship to one another. And um, so, once we get this sense that we've got eight arms and eight groups of major elements, so the question then says, well, which one fits where? So we can just put it on there, but which one fits? So it can go anyway. 
But what we've got in our picture here is that we've identified qualities to each of these arms. And so we can match up those qualities with the information that we're getting from people like Hauschka. And this is Nature of Substance. Hauschka's book, Nature of Substance. Dr. Hauschka. And, and so various um, elements can be put on here. Now, there, was, there is another reference that we can use, which is something uh, like an astrology birth chart. Because we identify an eastern horizon, and we then can sort of work in increasing complexity around from there. And the same with the periodic table of elements. We have qualities of these elements that we identify, which is, um, uh, you know, that this element here, these just have uh, plus one, you know, so it's a nucleus with just one electron, and then two electrons, three electrons, and so on until we come to eight electrons. Uh, so, so these are highly reactive, but they're, they're like small elements, and they get increasingly larger. And so we can use that sort of image as you know, beginning at that eastern horizon and just marking them off from that point of increasing complexity, just as we do in an astrology chart. Now, I guess part of the humour of this process is that I did that on the first day. I just did that. But that's abstract. It's actually a, a sort of a make-believe. There's not necessarily any truth in that. It's a nice device, but you're not going to take me seriously, really, if I tell you that. Either. So I then thought, well, I've got to look further than that. And so I started, as I say, looking at Hauschka. And so when we come to, uh, well, when we come to this picture here, we're identifying these arms. And we can look at these various elements and see what their qualities are. And we know, for example, the halogen elements, which are the um, uh, uh, fluoride, chlorine, bromide, iodine elements. And we know that they, they are very corrosive and that they actually kill things, that they bring processes to an end. And Rudolf Steiner talks about um, magnesium and fluoride as a process in our teeth and how the magnesium actually gives this sort of bolt to our teeth but it's the fluoride that hardens it and, it and they give this hard coating that brings things to an end. So we've got this sort of a, uh, image of a death process taking place. And this is what we have with the spirit. The, what, the spirit kills things. And while it brings consciousness, it's bringing that thought to an end. You know, and in that whole process of Gertian science, where we're wanting to live in the perception of a situation, and we want to sort of hold off from making that concept. We want to just keep gathering the, the, the information. So when we sort of harden it off to the concept, it's almost it's sort of killed it, killed the process. And so we can start to see that, in a sense, one of these spirit arms is going to uh, be an image of, of the halogen family. <coughs> we can then see that, that um, we've got these elements called the noble gases. And these elements are full. They've got all of their electrons full. And so they don't interact with anybody. They, they don't need to sort of, they don't need anybody. And I've got to say that this is an image of, of autism, that whole autistic spectrum, that, that they're actually just very self-contained. The biggest problem with autism is we want to interact with them, and they don't want to interact with us. And so we think they're weird, but in fact they're not. They're totally happy. And, and so we can identify that there is this sort of quality of the inner spirit here. That, that when you are centred completely in your internalised spirit, you don't have a need for much outside yourself because you're with yourself. And so we can identify that these 
rare, um, these noble gases sort of have similar qualities to what we identify with the internal spirit. We can then come into this, uh, these elements of the alkali elements, um, which are um, lithium and sodium and potassium, and, and identify how they work with the water sphere, and that they control the way in which water works within organic systems, you know, bodies and so forth, which brings us into this image of the etheric activity. But we also can see that, that um, where we have the internal, uh, what's going on here? Oh, getting lost in that picture there. So this is the etheric over here. And so in this section here, where we have an internalized etheric activity, we can identify these elements like magnesium and calcium that are being the anchors of the life processes within um, organic beings. Similarly, we can see that the elements carbon, silica, these are the foundation elements of the physical body. And so we could see that they might have a relationship with the internalized physical body, whereas the elements like boron and aluminium are these foundations of physical matter like clay. And so we can organize all of these bits of imagery and um, Basically, we only have to place one of these, don't we? Because they're in a series, they're in an order. So we only have to get one right, and everybody else will line up. But as a, so, so this is what we come up with. And so we can have the halogens here as the world spirit, the, um, yeah. The halogens is the, is the world spirit. This is your noble gases here, your alkalis, your calciums, and so on. And so this picture, in a sense, forms itself just through that cross-reference with Hauschka. Just forms itself. And just out of interest, what we get here is that these are the transition elements that these are the transition elements, so those elements that are involved in biological processes of life. And they're sitting between the world physical and the internal etheric body. So as soon as the internal etheric becomes involved with the physical, we've got biological activity. And that's where these trace elements that are fitting with that are sitting in this picture. And so, you know, there's a certain elegance about this.